This is a reading from Romans, chapter 14, verse 1 to 12. Except the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brothers or sisters? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, Every tongue will acknowledge God, so that each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. This is the word of the Lord. I'm Paul Walker. I am part of the pastoral team here. Today is our last Sunday in our Reconstruction with Jesus series. And we've been in this series that's sort of like a renovation project where like outlining some key shifts that that are helpful for the church that we believe are vital to renewal of the church's vision and mission. And it's important to point out that these are not like new things, but they actually represent just a return to the transformative power of the good news that Christians have proclaimed from the very beginning. That kind of news that ignited a movement that changed everything. And so, so far in our teaching series, we've covered the following. We've said that, one, God always looks like Jesus, and all scripture is properly read through him. We've said that to be saved includes belonging to a community under Jesus, called to live the life of the future now. We've said that evil is overcome through the power of suffering love. We've said that the Holy Spirit empowers us to partner in God's work of reconciling all things. Well, our last reconstruction project, our last paradigm shift that we want to look at today is that the church is defined by our shared center, not the lines we draw. The church is defined by our shared center, not the lines we draw. This is a reconstruction of how we do belonging and unity. You see, we live in a time in history where just so many people are asking, how can we be one when we are not the same? How can we be one when we are not the same? Is there something big enough to unite us when so much seems to tear us apart? And as we look at the landscape of the church in 2023, it seems that the church is like really good at moving away from each other, really good at dividing, really good at splitting. Like there was a split between the East and the West, between Catholic and Protestant, between Protestant, 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 Protestant. Today there are 47,300 denominations throughout the world, spread across 234 nations globally. It seems we don't know how to be one when we're not the same. It reminds me of a story of the Christian man who got shipwrecked on a deserted island. As the story goes, After many years of being shipwrecked on a deserted island, a ship sailing past the deserted island spotted the man who had been stranded there. The captain went ashore to rescue the man, and he noticed that the man had three huts. What's the first hut for? asked the captain. Well, that's my house, said the castaway man. What's the second hut for? Well, that's my church. What's that third hut over there for? Oh, that? The castaway man gets really upset. He has a scowl on his face. He says to the captain, 
Well, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> We're really good at dividing. <laughs> It's a joke sometimes. We're really good at moving away from each other. And I want to say that this is not actually unique to the church. It's actually something very present in our cultural moment. We live in the age of polarization, an age of heightened conflict and animosity. It's showing up in our politics, our cities, our neighborhoods, our families. It's showing up in every sphere of society because it seems we're getting more increasingly divided. And there's actually all sorts of statistics that are telling us this is the case. I want to share a few of them with you today. So 86% of North Americans say they feel exhausted by the division in society. 71% of North Americans say they have avoided talking about politics with someone whose political views are opposed to their own in the last 12 months. 77% of North Americans have few friends from another political party, and 41% of North Americans have no friends who vote for another political party. That's just a few of the revealing stats of we're not talking to each other. We're moving away from each other. And these are, these are North Americans, so they're pretty skewed by, by the United States, but the Canadian stats are just as revealing. So three out of four Canadians said they believe society has become more polarized. And this comes out of a study from the Canadian Hub for Applied and Social Research at the University of Saskatchewan. And this number honestly could probably be a little higher because we all know that the Saskatchewan Rough Riders have difficulty counting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a football joke. You're welcome. Here's one last revealing statistic. 40% of Canadians said they have reduced contact with friends or family over an argument about the pandemic or politics. We live in the age of polarization. We live in an age of animosity and conflict. We are moving away from each other because we don't know how to be one when we're not the same. Well, friends, as much as we are in this challenging cultural moment, it's not something that's new or unique. As the writer of Ecclesiastes puts it, there is nothing new underneath the sun. Polarization and division may be new for many of us at this point in our life, but it's not something that past generations have not experienced. Division, unity, conflict, they were just as prevalent in the early church and in the pages of Scripture. And that kind of may seem surprising to you. Because sometimes I think we have this impression of the early church as like they're holding hands, they're singing kumbaya, they're drinking tea and knitting sweaters, just like so peaceful. It was just chill. It's like, hey, we're all in one accord, we're all united, it's good. And only later did somehow it fall apart. But as we actually do a deep dive on the New Testament, as we look at the scriptures, we discover the opposite. In the book of Acts, there are multiple stories of conflict. In 1 and 2 Corinthians, there's division all over the place. In Romans, there's disunity about the weak and strong. In Galatians, there's division about Jew and Gentiles. Uh, in Ephesians, there's a conflict about ethics. In Philippians, there's a conflict about how to respond to persecution. In Colossians, there's a conflict about false teaching. In First and Second Thessalonians, there's a conflict about uh, eschatology. In First Timothy, uh, there's a conflict that Timothy is navigating with a church leader. Um, in Titus, there's disunity on the topic of who should be a leader. In the letter of Philemon, well, it's all about a conflict between a runaway slave with Onesimus and his master Philemon. In Hebrews, there's a disagreement about how to understand Jesus. In the book of James, there's disunity between the rich and poor and the understanding of faith and works. In 1 Peter, there's a disagreement about how to respond to persecution, and so on and so on. In every Every, almost every letter we have in the New Testament, there's some sort of conflict brewing. The early church wrestled with conflict, division, and disunity and disagreement. And it wasn't surprising to them. It wasn't something they were unaware of. It was as true of them as it is true of us. 
Megan Larissa Good puts it like this. She says, it's no coincidence that many letters preserved by the early church are profoundly concerned with questions of disagreement and unity within the nascent Christian community. So how did the early church do it? Like, how did they step into this? What were they doing to navigate this? How did they become one when they were not the same? Well, today we're going to zoom into our text in Romans 14. We're going to see how they do it. Because what we see there is a brewing division amongst the various Roman house churches. This is what we read in verse 1 of chapter 14. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak only eats vegetables. So, what's happening here? Well, Paul is opening up this, this section of Romans by saying, hey, like, you guys need to welcome one another. You need to be united. You need to accept one another. But that was not happening. Instead, all the house churches in Rome are quarreling. They're in conflict. They're not accepting each other. And why are they fighting? Well, it seems at, like, first glance, they're fighting about what's on the menu. Some can eat anything. Some are vegetarians. But as we zoom out to the rest of chapter 14, we actually see that Paul mentions a couple other conflicts. See, we have these two categories of people in Romans 14 to 15, the weak and the strong. And the weak are those whose consciences create a limiting boundary around a practice. The strong are those who have a wider, more expansive practice. And we see the following at work. So the weak is the one who does not eat everything. The strong, they can eat anything. The weak only eats vegetables. The strong, they eat meat. The weak considers one day more sacred than another. The strong considers every day alike. The weak abstains from wine. The strong partake in wine. Now, to us here in the modern day, this seems like a really strange thing to fight about. Like, really, they can't get along about what's on the menu? I mean, I think I can figure that out even in my house. Like, if I'm making a curry for Kaylee and I, I know my kids hate curry. Uh, so I throw in some chicken fingers and fries, and I feed the kids separately. I know how to, to solve that problem, right? Why not in Rome? Well, the tensions behind these tensions are way deeper than what's on the menu. The tension is an ethnic difference. It's a cultural difference. It's a theological difference. Who were the weak? Well, Paul doesn't like say it explicitly, but anyone reading that would have known. They were Jewish Christians who practiced kosher, who practiced Sabbath and food laws. See, in ancient Rome, Jewish people, they couldn't trust meat bought in the market. Meat was offered often in pagan rituals. It, most of it was pork. Most of it was not handled and processed in line with kosher laws. And so the Jewish population living in Rome just chose to remain vegetarian to keep faithful to Torah. And it's most likely at the start of the Roman church, everybody ate kosher. Like the early church would often start, like someone would come to them, they would receive the message. But it often started with Jewish people. Like, Paul would often go to synagogues first, and some would believe. And so you, it would primarily have a Jewish flavor, and then it opened up to the Gentile world around them. But this all drastically changed around the year 51 to 52 AD. There were some public protests by the wider Jewish population, and as a result, Emperor Claudius expelled the entire Jewish population. Everyone who was Jewish descent including all those Jewish Christians, they had to pack up and leave Rome. And this actually gets mentioned by Luke in Acts 18. We read there that Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila and native of Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Why? Because Claudius, the emperor, had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. So that's overnight the entire Roman church becomes 100% Gentile. They're culturally Gentile. They're inviting people now that are only Gentiles because all the Jews, well, they got expelled. Meat was back on the menu, boys. No more rotting maggoty bread. Now, to be clear, 
in Romans 14 and 15, kosher laws are disputable matters. A disputable matter is something that Scripture leaves room for someone to discern. We know that Jesus fulfills the law. We know that Gentiles are not asked to be kosher, but to follow Jesus. And Jesus in the Gospels said that it's not what goes into a person that makes them unclean. It's what comes out of their mouth and heart. That's what makes them unclean. So Jesus already altered food laws. But curiously, Jesus and all the New Testament authors never tell Jewish Christians to stop practicing kosher. They're just like, if you want to do that, sure. But what we have there is an unresolved tension. We have people that were born and raised in a Jewish culture now coming face to face with the reality that their brothers and sisters in their church are Gentiles. So this all comes to a boiling point when the Emperor Claudius dies in October of 54 AD. The edict against the Jews in Rome is rescinded, and all of a sudden they're welcome to return to Rome, and they did. And I want you to just imagine, you're a Jewish Christian, you've been kicked out of your home for a couple of years, you come back, you're walking back to Rome, and you're like, oh, I can't wait to see some of my old church friends, right? Can't wait to go see Rufus, and you're walking around in your old neighborhood, you're like, let's go to Rufus's house, you open the door, and there Rufus is just gnawing down on some pork ribs, you know, passing the bacon around, and you're like, what happened? It'd be weird, it'd be shocking, it would immediately highlight the tension. The church in Rome shifted while these Jewish Christians were away. Scott McKnight, in his Romans commentary, puts it like this. He says, The return of these Jewish Christians created tensions where it seems nearly certain that the expelled returned to lesser roles and status. During their exile, the Gentile Christians formed a new Christian culture, and it was not a Torah-observant culture. This was a tension you actually couldn't ignore in the ancient world. It wasn't like, hey, like, whatever, we're, let's just go to our separate homes. Christians in the early church did not meet in air-conditioned buildings like this. Where did they meet? In homes. And what's at the center of every Roman home? A table. A table, the place where food was served. Like, if I brought 30 people to your house today... I'm guessing most of us would end up at your table at some point. And what do you do when the table isn't kosher? What do you do when the central act of worship in the early church was sharing a meal and breaking bread in communion? That was the tension of the weak and strong. That was what was going on in Romans 14. That was the division. And it raised again the question, how can we be one when we're not the same? How can we be one when we are not the same? So what did the Apostle Paul do? What are we to do? Because honestly, this is still, like we have similar issues like this in the church today. Well, option one, Paul could have tried what's called a bounded set approach. Bounded church. And this is where you create a list of like all the essential practices and characteristics to determine whether a person belongs or not. Anyone who meets the requirements, they're in. Anyone who doesn't, they're out. And so if the Apostle Paul wanted to approach this division in Romans in a bounded set way, he could have turned to the church in Rome and said, come on, guys, strong people, just eat kosher. Come on, just eat kosher. Just give up on bacon. Stop it. He could have turned to the weak people, and he could have said, hey, just stop being so legalistic. Come on, break out that pulled pork. Have you tried bacon? It's so good. <laughs> you see, both the strong and the weak can draw lines. This is not a conservative liberal thing. Anyone can be bounded to that. No matter what you believe, you can create boundaries. You can say you only belong when you fit my boundaries. Both determine who belongs by where they draw the line. And the pro huge problem with this is that it creates judgmentalism, and it always, always leads to disunity. It doesn't invite people to a process. So maybe the Apostle Paul could have tried option two. This is called fuzzy, fuzzy set. And option two, fuzzy set, is where you spend your time erasing the lines. 
You downplay difference and distinction. And, you, and it's unity by constantly erasing and redrawing boundaries. It's like whenever you come up against the line, you're like, well, we got to erase that line, draw a new one. And it's just constantly erase, draw, erase, draw. One of the benefits is that people are taught not to be judgmental. But the result is a lack of clarity and confusion because the only distinction is that we have no distinctions. If Paul was fuzzy set, he could have said to the church in Rome, let's just erase the lines. Can't we just all get along? Your differences aren't that big of a deal, are they? The problem with that, of that, of saying that fuzzy set approach is it actually doesn't bring together people together in their differences. It doesn't give people a shared purpose or center of unity. It downplays difference and causes minorities to submit to the status quo. And worse yet, people spend most of their time just having the arguments about whether we should erase and draw that line and redraw that line. The result is unity for unity's sake. And that will always cause people to drift apart. Unless we're on mission together, unless there's clarity, we drift apart. And that too creates polarization. So what are we to do? What did the Apostle Paul do in Rome? Did he do bounded set? Did he do fuzzy set? Was it option A or option B? Well, in this Reconstruction series, our paradigm shift this week reminds us that there is an option C. The church is defined by our shared center, not the lines we draw. And so what we see working out in the Roman church is what's called a centered set. A centered set approach stops focusing on the lines. Rather than drawing a line to identify people based on their common characteristics, like do they eat pork or not, a centered set uses a directional and relational basis of evaluation. The group is defined by creating a center and allowing people to engage with their relationship with the center. A center set approach doesn't deny difference or reinforce difference. Instead, it puts all its energy to say, what unites us? What unites us? What unites us? And out of that union, out of that clarity at the center, you get, you get a shared unity. Another example of this is our solar system. Like, we have some really different planets in our solar system. We got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and can you believe it, we even have a Uranus right over there. How do you keep these different planets together? How do you keep them together? The gravity of the center, the sun. And in the same way, the divine gravity of Jesus holds the church together. It doesn't say everybody be one planet. It allows Jew and Gentile to have the same orbit. I want to walk you through how Paul does this in Romans 14. So starting in verse 7, he says, None of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this, is the, for this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Notice what the Apostle Paul is doing here. In a church divided in factionalism, he's reminding them that the center of their lives is not themselves. Let's get that verse back up again. The center of their lives is not them, themselves. For none of us lives for ourselves alone. What's at the center of our life? If we live, we live for the Lord. Who do we belong to? We belong to the Lord. Christ is Lord over who? Both the living and the dead. I'll show you another example of this in Romans 14. Verse 17, Paul writes, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. What's the center of the kingdom? Is it our boundary line? Is it eating and drinking? Is it kosher, non-kosher? Is it Jew or Gentile? No, it is peace and righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit. Last example. This is from Romans 15, verse 7. 
Paul says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. How can we be one when we're not the same? Because we are already one in Christ. The gravity of Jesus brings us together. Christ has already accepted the weak and strong. And so the weak and strong need to accept each other. And so in this entire moment, movement from Romans 14 to 15, the Apostle Paul is bringing these people into a shared orbit, into one family of a Jesus at the center. And notice he doesn't take a fuzzy set approach. He doesn't say, let's just get, all, get along or your differences don't matter. Paul is not saying that differences don't matter. Jewish Christians get to be fully Jewish Christians. Gentile Christians get to be Gentile Christians. And the Apostle Paul is giving them a way to be one, but not the same. They're in the same orbit because the, what's at the center is way, way more profound than what, what is true of them separately. Now, we should say this is not a whatever attitude about behaviors, practices, and discipleship. Because they have clarity of Jesus at the center, there's clarity about how the weak and strong need to relate to each other. And so that's why we're not surprised as you read Romans 14 and 15, there's a whole series of correctives because there's clarity about what the center is. And so Paul has a bunch of things he says to the Romans. Please stop doing this. Stop quarreling over disputable matters. Stop judging someone else's servant. Stop putting any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Stop making the kingdom of God a matter of eating and drinking. Stop destroying the work of God for the sake of food. Stop excluding, judging, condemning. Stop tearing others down. Stop dividing and quarreling. And then he has, because again, there's clarity about who Jesus is, this is what they need to start doing. They need to start accepting the one whose faith is weak. Stop passing judgment on one another. Act in love. Practice righteousness or justice. Peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. Make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Bear with. Build them up. Accept one another. Notice the clarity of behavior, practice, discipleship. Like, there is a clarity to say that when the weak and strong are quarreling, when they're judging, when they're destroying the work of God for the sake of food, they are moving away from the center. But when they accept one another, when they act in love to each other, they are moving towards Jesus at the center. The church is defined by our shared center not the lines we draw. So I want to close by just saying this is an important reconstruction for all of us. Our divided and polarized age is leaving us all exhausted and fractured. And I believe that our world is just longing for an alternative. And the tragedy is sometimes that the church mirrors the division around us. And when we do that, we get off mission. My dear friend, Adam Dyer, he puts it like this. He says, a polarized church has nothing to say to a polarized world. Therefore, if we are going to bring the gospel of Jesus, we must offer a life that stands in contrast. I want to close our time together by naming that having a new approach to disagreement doesn't make disagreement any easier. It doesn't fix all our problems Having a center set approach does not fix everything overnight. We will often get things wrong. We will often not love each other perfectly in the church. But that's why we need to be a community leaning into Jesus that teaches us to forgive each other, to bear with one another. My prayer and hope for our church is that we can be a part of that solution. Amen. Paul, we have a bunch of questions coming in. Thank you so much. Okay, starting with, a lot of people asked, um, how do we figure out who are the strong and who are the weak? Um, it seems that we all define ourselves as the strong ones. Mm. And is one better than another? 
one is not better than the other. They both belong to the Lord. Mm. And part of our problem is we, we want to evaluate which one is better. Maybe the language of weak and strong kind of does that. Like, I can feel that tension. But Paul is more highlighting power dynamics than he's making a commentary about who they are. They're weak because all these returning exiles didn't have voices of leadership and influence in the Roman community. So there's a weakness of they are the people that are on the margins in their community, and he's naming that. The strong are are those that have a wider boundary of practice. The weak are the people that they they have a limiting. Their conscience does not allow them to participate in a, in a behavior, right? I've, I've seen this in many ways in churches. Like, for example, uh, in our, one, one of the people in our church in England, like, he, he used to be a raging alcoholic. And he, he had this moment with Jesus, this come-to-Jesus moment, where he gave up booze. And for him, it was like, well, this is my limitation. And I think... What, what you could do to sin against him is to tell him that limitation doesn't matter. To tell him that he should work against his conscience. And I think that's, that's a good example of let's learn to accept that someone has a limitation and that someone can partake. Amazing. Okay, this next question is almost twofold. So, how can we model this center-set approach within the larger church community when we see others adamantly drawing lines and boundaries to exclude or include individuals in speaking truth in love. Mm-hmm. So if Jesus is at the center, what does that actually practically mean is the second fold? I think the way we lean into the wider church outside these walls is we be completely center set in our mm-hmm. approach. That we don't look at people that are drawing lines and then draw our own lines. That's the temptation, is to see those legalists over there and say, aren't we better? Mm. (laughs) We can't. I think we have to move towards, not move away. And everything that's, like, tearing us apart, we need to to speak the truth in love, yes. But how do you do that? You have to have relationship. Mm. I'd also encourage you that, like, you're always going to find examples out there. Mm -hmm. And I think... You have to make more decisions and more realization and discernment within your actual life. There are people you've never met. You're going to hear a story about how they're judgmental. The question you need to ask is, how's that getting lived out in my context? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, so it also seems that nowadays people have their own truth. So a lot of the focus is being on the lines. Um, Are there ways to determine or even prevent the centered church mentality. Not prevent that, but prevent focusing on the lines and focusing on the center, practically speaking, because it's very subjective, I think, in this generation. Mm. Well, I, I totally agree that there, there's a fuzziness mm-hmm. about what is truth. Like, everyone has their own truth. I think Paul speaks to this in Romans 14 and 15. Remember what he says. He says... We belong to the Lord. I think Christians are these curious people that when they talk about truth, they point to this traveling teacher and prophet, Messiah called Jesus from Nazareth. That's where truth is. And that, that's an exclusive claim, that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I think, how do we, how do we avoid focusing on the lines? Put all your attention, put all your effort, put all your, your focus into worshiping, honoring Jesus, of hearing from him, of spending daily time. Everything you do in your life, let that be with Jesus at the center. Hmm. Amazing. Okay, let's do one more question. Again, practically speaking, how can we love someone we disagree with? Just practically speaking, because hmm. that's sometimes really hard. Well, I think often the assumption in, in our culture is that to disagree means you can't love someone. That's a curious thing if you put that in a different context. If you said to, like, a couple sitting in my office that's there for premarital counseling, 
And I said to them, if you ever disagree, you don't love each other. Man, that marriage is falling apart that evening. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the first thing is like rid yourself of the notion that conflict means that we can't love each other. Mm -hmm. Often, the most significant relationships in your life will have conflict. You will disagree. And how do we navigate that? Well, you go towards, you ascribe to them infinite love. You remind yourself, how does God see this person? He sees them as his beloved child. You go towards them, you, you listen, you understand, you repeat back to them, you, you help them process, and you help yourself process. You look at the plank in your own eye. There are a million steps. But it starts, it starts with knowing that conflict will happen. Mm. Awesome. We struggle with that as Canadians. We're very polite. And sometimes we think um, that, that not saying anything is, mm -hmm. is loving. It's, mm -hmm. it's not always loving. Mm -hmm. yeah. right, I remember the story. I'll tell this sure. quick. <laughs> I remember I was, at, I was at this bonfire with some friends. And it was like a big bonfire. There were lots of people there. And my friend Cody, he got really angry at one of the guys. And I see them fighting in the corner. And all of a sudden, because this guy is in his truck, and Cody reaches in, pushes this guy out of the way, and he takes his keys, and he throws them. Like, I didn't know where he threw them. And well, I was just watching. And I was like, man, Cody, you're the worst, <laughs> right? And then I walk over to Cody, and I was like, why did, you, why did you throw that guy's keys? It didn't seem you were being that loving. He's like, that guy is like blackout drunk. Mm -hmm. If I let him get in his truck, he was going to kill someone or himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. if, if you have a culture where you say, like, we're never going to talk about mm -hmm. what's at the center, about what's loving, you're going to enable people to hurt others. Mm -hmm. And that's what I learned from Cody that day. Wow. That's, that's powerful. Thank you so yeah. much, Paul. Would you close? Uh, yeah, I'd love to close. Would you please stand with me? In ancient times and ancient places, those who wanted to receive a blessing held out their hands like this. And those who gave the blessing held out their hands like this. The blessing I want to send you out with today is from Ephesians chapter 4. It goes like this. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in peace today.